Well, good morning, everyone. This is Bruce McKellar. I work with MSU Extension down in the southwest part of the state, and we are here at the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. This morning, we're going to talk about irrigation scheduling after a wet spring. Our uh, specialist uh, presentation today will be from Stephen Miller, who is our irrigation spe specialist at MSU Extension. Just a reminder: We, uh, if you're if you're logged in, questions can come to us probably the easiest through the chat pod, and so go ahead and uh, click on the the chat pod at any time to do questions. Also, we have a uh, Phil Cates has put up our uh, a link that will click you to our evaluation for the session. So we'd appreciate it greatly if you could uh, fill the evaluation as you as you uh, complete this meeting this morning. It would help us. Uh, Get a little feedback as to how we're doing. So, well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Stephen Miller and uh, his talk on uh, irrigation scheduling after this very wet spring. Steve? Thanks, Bruce, and good morning. Uh, the uh, slide that's up now has uh, in contact information for both myself and for Lyndon Kelly. Uh, Lyndon is the uh, Purdue and MSU irrigation educator. The websites listed are important because we're going to go through a lot of material today very quickly. Uh, we will, this presentation will be available on the, the Crops Team Virtual Breakfast uh, uh, website as well as will be on uh, the MSU website. You can either click on this link or just Google MSU Irrigation or our names and you will should get up and get, get the data. So, Couple of reminders. First of all, there are some additional resources available on the delayed planning website developed by MSU Extension. There's also a, a Ag Innovation Day scheduled this year focusing on precision agriculture that pays. It will be uh, July 26th at, here at MSU. So with our late planning, our cool, wet weather, we have shifts in the development curves. These uh, are going to change and make irrigation more critical in this year. For one thing, we have shorter, less extensive root zones, uh, therefore less bottle water available in our, in our bank, in our field capacity. Uh, therefore, we might, we need to keep that in consideration as far as when we're deciding. With a slow develop, slow development, uh, it's we're going to be work hard toward balancing avoiding drought stress with concern for aggravating crop crop disease. If you're still thinking about predict about planting soybeans, there's uh, we ran I ran soy water. That's a uh, irrigation program out of. Nebraska that's been adapted for Michigan, showing that with our late planning, uh, we're getting to R7 fairly late. Of course, harvest after that uh, resource if you want to take a look at that later. So with our good management with irrigation, we got to remember that uh, the, we can our, lose our crop loses a lot of water uh, when we get hot and, and dry, up to three tenths of a year. The graph shown is from Minnesota, but we have pretty similar situations here in Michigan. The uh, what we work with when we're working with this is a reference ET, or how much water will be lost to a well-watered grass. This is based on experiments that have been conducted. We need to adjust that for the crop that we have, uh, and there's some uh, some values for the various crops. So we need to adjust that in terms of subcrop like corn. We use more than the reference AT where some of the things where we have less canopy cover where you lose using less water. So where do we get this reference information? In Michigan, you can go to our fairly extensive EnviroWeather site uh, where you can get uh, data from uh, uh, both ET and, and rainfall at these sites. You can also get the information text or email to you every morning about 5.30 by going to the site and signing up for this information. So this will feed into some programs that we have. Uh, we have uh, Excel, MSU has an Excel spreadsheet. What we're doing with this is we're trying to keep our balance between, we don't want to over irrigate or go above the field capacity or the that point by which more our water flows by gravitational will look beyond our root zone. Obviously, we don't want to get to total depletion. So, allowable depletion during the year depends on the time of the year. 
uh, in terms of allowing uh, this uh, early on. A little more deletion, a little more depletions necessary. Although th this year that might we uh, probably should make sure if we can that we are uh, we're avoiding getting lower. We have a paper version of our scheduler that's available online at our websites. What's important as we go through this though is that we have a rain gauge at each field. You also might have some value, some of the, the companies, seed corn companies are from some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the services you can provide might pro provide you that data. But it's important to have these rain gauges due to our variation in our, our local weather. <clears throat> We are developing a low cost remote monitoring system. This is being developed by Dr. Young Sark Dong. He's a postdoc within biosystems ag engineering uh, working with me in London here at MSU. This system, which would, can be implemented uh, in the field for about $250 per site, uh, can stores our data, puts it up to the web, and we can use this now, we've developed it now for both leaf lightness sensors and soil moisture sensors. So that's a quick overview. Again, there's a lot of information on our, our website. You have our contact information if you have questions. Uh, now we're gonna turn it over to Lyndon Kelly. He's gonna talk about the issues we might have with chemigation, with applying our particularly late fertilizer applications in this year. Lyndon? You want to go ahead? Thanks, Steve. I uh, appreciate the idea of Steve covering the irrigation scheduling first because we hear a lot of questions this time of year. If I have irrigation, can I use it to help me make up for some of the challenges I'm having with getting my nitrogen on or other or sulfur? Um, but if I don't have some kind of good method, the irrigation scheduling or a good uh, monitoring system, um, I I don't want to overfill the profile and push the nitrogen through that I'm doing the application. So Steve, if you can get me on to slide, uh, nope, we're bouncing through. If, um, if we think about issues, we've got lots of water for the plant out there, but we're, we want to put the nitrogen on. Sometimes irrigation is a good way to incorporate the nitrogen and use a fairly inexpensive and rapid system. Um, the, the extreme area would be the aerial application of nitrogen, ammonium sulfate or urea through the airplane, and then watering it in with two tenths of an inch. Um, uh, some high boy applications or tractor applications, if we're short, we float over the top and dribble the nitrogen on and then hope for a rainfall the next night. If the rainfall doesn't come that evening, then we may use two tenths of an inch or so to incorporate that. But most of us think about fertigation and chemigation as actually putting the fertilizer through the system, um, and that's a, an option too. Next slide down. Um, basically, we want to match that uptake curve. And remember, corn during the rapid growth phase is using the most of its nitrogen, um, but we want to have some nitrogen into that crop um, if we have the option to do fertigation. Um, one of the more important apl applications is going to be right at tasseling or right before tasseling. Um, yes, we'd like to get the most out of this uh, um, nitrogen, um, but it, we'd like to see that yield bump. This is especially important on sandy soils, and most of our irrigation is on sandy soils where we're more likely to have lost our early N and that where we may be more nitrogen challenged. Next slide, please. Um, if we are using irrigation for either application or watering in, it's a good idea to have it as uniform as possible. This graph is constructed uh, through a, a system we use of collecting data points. Um, each of those dots represent uh, the amount of water that was falling at that point. And as you notice, this machine puts less and less water on until you get to the far end and then the, the um, far end end gun um, overwaters. But uh, fertilizer put through this machine is going to have that same um, variable application. And uh, unfortunately, this one's light right at the far end. And remember, the far end of the machine is where most of the water application is done because of the geometry of the situation. Next slide, please. Yeah, Lennon, I think I uh, will point out that when we've looked at this, a lot of our issues we have 
are, are with the end gun and with that lower reach. So it's important to yeah. to really focus uh, on that and and that emphasizes the importance of, of getting your system ran, you know, making sure it's running properly as quickly as possible. Right. If um if we take a look at machines, there are some machines there's performance just just not up to par. Um, if you look at the one in the background here, it's actually running the whole cornering arm um, right next to the road. So we're getting a, a tremendous over application in their area. So if you have machines that haven't, you haven't been through, it's bad to have water problems and waste water. But when you put a chemical through there, we're actually uh, uh, challenging our, the potential to, uh, to uh, actually damage our water supply underneath us. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other uh, ways of uh, looking at that. 85% uh, or greater as far as a uniformity test. If you haven't done a uniformity test, at least make sure that the machine is operating within 10% of what the package specifications are. So if a machine's supposed to be getting 50 pounds, we better uh, pressure at the center pivot point. Uh, we better be at between at least 45 and 55, or that's probably not a potential re machine to run. Uh, no major leaks, no major runoff issues. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're not overfilling the profile. Next slide, please. Uh, to help us protect the groundwater underneath us or the uh, river water that we're pulling up, we use uh, chemigation backflow valves. This is a backflow valve that creates an air gap to break the um, vacuum uh, created by the lower water. Uh, when the water shuts off, the water wants to go back to its original level, and that's always going to be lower than the field level. So that vacuum valve, uh, um, that vacuum breaker within the chemigation valve is essential. Positive displacement pumps are a part, essential part of this whole system. Um, that gives us a way to shut off and turn on the system. Um, it also positive uh, displacement means that we're going to not put more on fertilizer on when we have uh, the supply tank full than we do when we're empty. Um, and it's important to remember when we're trying to put a lot of fertilizer on with a, a small application of water, say 60 pounds of N um, with only two tenths of an inch of water, it's going to take a much bigger pump than we commonly use for these situations. And then last but not least, we'd like that injection pump to be um, linked uh, to the rest of the system. We call that safety interlocking. And it's a uh, design that makes sure that if the center pivot shuts off, that the water shuts off and the fertilizer pump shuts off, or if any one of the three components, the fertilizer pump, the water pump, or the center pivot, uh, or the distribution system, if any of those shut off, the whole system goes down so that we're not um, putting a lot of fertilizer in one place. Uh, last slide. Uh, and then last thing to, to say there, if we are running irrigation and going to use it for fertilizer or chemicals, it's not a good idea to have that be the, the first trial run of the year. Think of all the years that you put irrigation and started. Uh, that startup day can be a rough day. Uh, everything from flat tires to leaks to uh, things that you didn't think about. Um, and uh, you want to have those all worked out of the system before we make it a little more complicated by putting the fertilizer or the chemical through it. If you have any questions about uh, fertigation or chemigation or using your irrigation to get more out of uh, your, your management, um, give me a call. I'd be glad to talk to people. My phone number is on the first slide. Steve? Okay. Uh, so, Bruce, you're going to take it sure. from here? For I can take it from here. I'll just have you advance this slide again. And I would like to thank you for attending this morning. Um, uh, of course, our field crops webinar series or Bruce we can't hear you oh, sorry can you hear me now or no yes Is thank you better? okay anyway we'd like to thank you for attending this morning our field crop uh, uh, virtual breakfast series and you can follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook and, and uh, see our current activities